Let's welcome uh, Jay Rosenbaum. Hi, everyone. Um, I often get asked, how did you get here? And isn't machine learning really hard? And I understand that. I'm an artist, not a traditional developer. But I do have a small background in coding, back in the long, long ago, and I know enough. What is that they say? A little knowledge is a dangerous thing? Yeah, that's me. I didn't know machine learning was hard when I started. I think that's the thing you all need to know. I saw something cool, and I found a repo with instructions. I had to learn everything. But I was excited about the project and the possibilities, and I dove into the deep end head first. It wasn't until I was in neck deep that I realized how difficult it all was. And by then, the only way out was through. And then another project came along, and another, and another, and a different way of doing things, and another, and I just got swept up in it all. Because when you're passionate about something, when you're excited to get going, there aren't that many barriers to entry. As long as you remain stubborn and enthralled by the thing you're pursuing and the resources are there, you can work your way through anything. That is why machine learning and mixed reality and IoT are so exciting. Because not only can you make amazing things, but the resources are there to help you with almost every problem you come across. And I should know, because I've come across a lot. But I'm getting ahead of myself. A developer and an artist, how does that even work? Don't they use different parts of the brain or different and totally unrelated abilities? Absolutely not. You'd be amazed at the mathematics that are present in painting, in planning an artwork, in arranging the composition and mixing the colors. The physics and chemistry in producing a painting or a sculpture. Creative endeavors are seen as easy because the hard science beneath is cleverly hidden. But painting and art making are just another facet of creation, just like producing an app or a web page or a robot. And all creating uses a wealth of skills. Programming is a language like art. And programming is an art form. But when people ask, isn't machine learning really hard? My response is, so is everything worth doing. Because it is. Everything is hard at first. Painting is hard. Programming is hard. Everything involves knowledge of your framework or your substrate, your materials or language, and the basic principles underneath that help govern your creation. You don't need to be Picasso to start either. Anyone can pick up a paintbrush or a camera, but you have to dedicate yourself to it and decide to make something amazing. That decision is what matters, not the skill you bring into it at the start, but the decision to start, the skill you evolve as you progress, and what you have to say with what you make. What do you want to say? And how do you want to say it? Anything worth doing should involve asking yourself those questions and then working through the answers. It's as simple and as difficult as that. Whether you're making art or making code or both, those questions should be your first stop. When I started in my master's degree, I was a painter. And having painted for over 10 years, I was not bad. I made it, uh, 3D models to act as life models for my paintings, and that was working well for me. So I went into my master's feeling pretty confident. I actually got in without a bachelor's degree. So I had a conversation with the head of department during a review. It uh, went along the lines of, look, your paintings are good, but, and I'm thinking, oh, no. And he went on to say, these renders, these are where it's at. And it caused me to take a good hard look at where I wanted to go. Because over the years, I'd started enjoying the process of painting less and less, and the 3D modeling more and more. And I was enjoying learning about different things I could do with it and say with it. I wasn't saying anything truly new or unique with my paintings. So in a way, this was my opportunity to say goodbye to painting and go after the area I was most interested in, making art with my computer. And it was amazing. Then I saw a simple augmented reality app that a, friend, a fellow artist commissioned uh, to bring one of his paintings to life. He uh, commissioned, uh, Jim Thalassoudis commissioned it from apositive.com.au. And 
being a very wealthy artist, he could afford to pay somebody to do it. Uh, but it inspired me. I found a simple app, Orasma, that would allow me to create it online. And I put together a short animation and shyly showed one of my professors. And he literally took a step back in shock. And that was it. I was hooked on that reaction, on that moment. And I was hooked on the idea of revealing a truth behind the work to be able to show more than the printed piece would allow. I'm a gamer and I loved the idea of hiding Easter eggs in my work. But I still had something to, I had to find something to say with all of this technology because it's all very well and good having awesome technology. But as my supervisor said to me, where is the art? And I took that to heart and I ask myself that every time because the art is the important part the message, the meaning, the reason for its existence. While I was muddling through this dilemma of what to say with my work, a friend shared an Imgur post on style transfer and I started to delve into the possibilities. I was already intrigued by Deep Dream, but I couldn't see any use for it in my work. But this, this just clicked for me. My work uses a lot of archaeological influences, and I thought it would be interesting to see the computer reinterpret my work in the style of its original inspiration. But the easy-to-use website, ostagram.ru, was down because the post went viral. So I furiously scanned the comments, looking for another option, something that would allow me to harness this amazing technology. I was already so obsessed. And there it was, a link to the repo. I barely had any idea what I was doing. But I remembered how to use command line functions. It couldn't be that hard, right? That for first repo used Torch as the framework and Lua as the language. And I remember going from repo to repo and learning how to download all of the dependencies because it didn't have a requirements.txt. And I learned how to use pip and homebrew. And it took me a few days, but I got it working. And I produced my very first style transfer. It was hideous, but it was mine. Well. Mine and my computers. I didn't know where it was going when I started. I didn't know what the art would be. I was still hooked on the technology at this point, but I could see something there, some potential for augmented reality and machine learning together to make something new. And it started to resolve. It started to come through. I started working with the base code, but my favorite part was the way the works would slowly transform across the iterations and slowly, the final work started to take shape. But I hit a snag. It turns out Orasma was very expensive. And if I wanted my own branding and interface, I had to pay them, I think it was $5,000 for a white labeled app. So I started to research more options and realized that the cheapest way would be to make an uh, app for myself using a library like Vuforia or Wikitude. After all, how hard is it to get an app approved on the app store? It couldn't be that hard, right? Yeah, I asked myself that question a lot. But thanks to the power of Google and a lot of hard work, I made my own augmented reality app and 14 machine learning animations that shift back and forth that were presented with seven realistic renders and seven laser cut uh, abstractions based on the machine learning outputs. And the art, where's the art in all of this? I titled the app Recursion. Recursion is where a function being defined is applied in its own definition, as you all know. In linguistics, it's about repetition. Each artwork in this series is repeated and resolves to each other. There's a pattern inside each one. In gender, the act of defining your own gender also helps clarify it for you and contribute to the known definitions of gender. We define our gender for ourselves and then apply that definition and that helps others with their own gender journey. These works are about transness and about non-binary and non-passing transness in particular. They're about the internal journey of being a trans person and how we're so much more than our bodies or our outward presentation. In this case, the art is more than what's on the wall, but a deeply personal internal visual monologue for each person. This was my first exploration into machine learning and I was hooked. My research for my PhD is on computer perceptions of gender and the way that machines learn and create. And there is no better way to a medium to explore that than through the lens of augmented reality and artificial intelligence. 
My first works, my most recent ex works explore gender with a mixed data set of marble statuary. The results blend gender together in a fascinating way that I'm excited to continue exploring. I then examined the abstract results and created my own responses to the generated works. These all unite seamlessly together inside an app that explores interactive 3D models based on the generated art with a neural network generated narrative based on image classifications and captions that shift in gender and tone. By mixing different media, displays on the wall, music, speech, and 3D modeling, I'm leveraging mixed reality technologies to keep it all in place and create an installation experience. While the technology is cool here, the meaning is clear. It examines the social construct of gender and assumptions based on first glances. The soundtrack elements for this series were inspired by the works of Troy Innocent, who uses augmented reality and creates work around the nature of code and concepts of pattern recognition and how they affect the world at large. His highly geometric works, both in gallery and based in Melbourne's iconic laneways, are centered around code as a visual language and the augmented reality component firing off sound elements, overlaying digital map keys and weather visualization shows machines responses to pattern recognition as well as our own. While there is no machine learning directly in these works, they explore the concept of the daily machine learning that surrounds us. Extended reality is the term for layering a new interactive digital reality on top of our existing mundane one. It encompasses interactive mixed reality, augmented reality via traditional means and via wearables, and virtual reality. A world layered on our own, a screen's width away, a world of digital creations and digital intelligence. We grant access to other worlds through augmented reality. Why not also explore the spaces where machines learn? There are a number of platforms for developing augmented reality depending on your budget and objectives. You can get a white label app from Orasma and do everything via their web interface. Or if you're like me and have no money, you, and you're happy to experiment with the possibilities, you may find Vuforia, Wikitude, Eighth Wall, or AR.js the best solution. The first three all have packages that work in Unity. They're all free to test out. Wikitude is free for your first app, and Eighth Wall at this stage is free to use and deploy. They're all excellent development options for pretty much all you need to get started building your first AR app. In this case, you can build it in Unity, Xcode, or Android Studio, add your interactions, deploy it to the app stores to allow people to download it. This is so cool. It's awesome to see your name in the app store, but it turns out that not everyone wants to download an app to their devices just for one event, even if it is cool. And Unity is wonderful for cross-platform development, but it's slow and it's bulky. The Unity to App Store pipeline is a lot of work. Your other option is to sideload it to devices that are available at the venue to, for people to use, which then becomes a security concern. Enter AR.js. It's the first live web AR system. All your user needs to do is point their phone browser at a web page and then look at markers or use the live demo options. It's much cleaner and faster. In fact, if you take out your phones, I hope this works, and go to minxdragon.github.io, uh, it works best in landscape, I will say that, uh, you should see a quick and dirty live web AR demo. <laughs> I haven't had time to test this with the screens, so I, with the projection, it should work. What you should be seeing is a little style transferred tux animating. Yeah? Yes! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> now, at the moment, it's somewhat rudimentary. The marker recognition is mainly for classic AR style markers, but the resolution and speed are excellent. And the future is looking ripe for web-based AR development. This is just a few lines of code. Eighth Wall have just released their own web-based AR system, which has very powerful simultaneous location and mapping technology, which allows things to appear on the ground like they're really in the world. Google and Apple are both working on web AR that leverages AR Kit and AR Core. These all use JavaScript and A-Frame web VR, allowing us to use WebGL, 
which is live 3D rendering for the web. WebGL can be created in platform, online platforms such as Sketchfab or in more sophisticated programs like Unity and Blender. And suddenly, you can leverage your 3D content online. Now, why does augmented reality online excite me so much? Because of emerging machine learning technologies for the web. ML5.js is a group of JavaScript libraries specifically for machine learning and are making machine learning technology accessible to many developers. Like AR.js, they use just a few lines of code to access a new world of development. Emoji Scavenger Hunt uses TensorFlow Lite, a lightweight framework for mobile use. And it's a great example of machine learning game that pulls together webcam footage with a classifier to find real world emoji using TensorFlow.js. There's a demo on their website and the code to implement it yourself. Many formats of machine learning already rely on image uh, camera image classification, PoseNet and YOLO, which stands for you only look once rather than the more traditional you only live once. And they all use live webcam data and super superimpose their results over the top. This is, in a way, a form of augmented reality and in the future can be used to supplement live augmented reality apps. Apps like Snapchat and any app that has a similar facial detection and overlay system also uses machine learning and augments reality to display the results. Snapchat filters and the like have become so eponymous with everyday selfies, it's easy to forget that they use machine learning and augmented reality seamlessly together. It seems strange to think of Snapchat as a leader in these extremely cool technologies merging together, but in a way it's very fitting. It's augmenting our own very personal realities, our faces, crafting a new appearance and sending it out to the world as a human CG a hybrid constructed using AI facial detection, a webcam and augmented reality additions and components. It is post-human in the best sense. In fact, I'm so obsessed with Snapchat, it's become an area of exploration for me, using a DC GAN to generate images based on Snapchat selfies. I love the way it entwines the hybrid computer-human mashups and brings them together. Computers only understand what they've been taught, and so its interpretations are fresh and interesting. Working machi with machine learning is never boring. My favorite part is that at e different points, it focuses on different qualities. It may choose to render just faces for a while as it detects the commonality in all of the images. Then it may focus just on the little animal noses or the glasses additions, creating swirling wires around the eyes. Sometimes it may even focus on people sharing their Snapchat scan code because I didn't clean my data set properly. Snapchat. Instagram, Facebook, and similar filters all work on facial data recognition and uh, detection. The most robust one seems to be Snapchat's, which is also the oldest. They use machine learning to recognize the features of a face and see and how it moves. They then resize and fit 3D augmentations to that facial template. Further complexity is added in augmentations like the puppy one, where it detects your mouth opening and adds an animated tongue into the mix. These are quite good at detection, and while you can use adversarial methods to avoid the facial recognition, it's a surprising amount of work to foil. I'm amazed that it picked up the Francis Bacon uh, self-portrait. That's just, that looks like an incredibly adversarial image to me, but it didn't have much problem finding it. Snapchat in particular can alter the shape of a face and add instant photoshopping. The glitter elements respond to movement and light sources. And it's great for amusing board kits. As depth sensing and light detection technologies become standard, we can expect to see more of this. We'll see more semantic style transferring on the fly as phone processing improves. Apps such as Prisma and Oilist already use feed forward style transfer in their apps and are well on their way to style transferring our realities. If we, if we return to Van Gogh here with his little Snapchat ears, we have Prisma on the left and Oilist on the right. Oilist even allows you to change it as it's painting, being the closest we have right now to creating a painted digital reality on the fly. Facebook is working with uh, Prisma to create live style transferred videos, and I wouldn't be surprised if Oilist and Snapchat are also working on it. I mentioned a DC GAN earlier, which is the main area of my research at the moment. 
DC GAN stands for Deep Convolutional Generative Adversarial Network. A GAN is actually two neural networks, a generator and a discriminator. They both work off the same data set. The generator creates while the discriminator critiques and rejects the creations that don't fit the data set. Through seeing which works pass and which fail, the generator learns to make works that fulfill the criteria. There are a range of different GANs for different frameworks and outcomes. Pix2Pix, which is an image and video translation GAN, is probably the most widely used in the AR art community. There's even a JavaScript Pix2Pix for live browser work, but it's a little slow for phones at the moment. I use a DC GAN in TensorFlow because of its stability and ease of use. Machine learning ranges from everyday uses such as shop recommendations and maps to generating art and music and medical diagnostics. It's a huge area of exploration and the hottest one too. The other hot technology is augmented reality and it won't be long before we see these together more and more, whether in simple methods or complex ones such as creating art. And creating art can be done in so many different ways, whether using deep dream, style transfer, digital coloring, picks to picks or wholesale generation. We can generate music and videos and even comic pages from videos. The options are limitless for those unafraid to attempt it and jump in head first. And one thing leads to another and then another and before you know it, you're on a stage talking about the possibilities of machine learning and art. Machine learning options are becoming more accessible to everyone with the right tools and interests. Runway.ml is a beta machine learning GUI with hooks for Unity, VS Code, Blender, Photoshop, and more. This allows creatives to get directly involved with the making of art without all of the command line work and framework installation and inevitable CUDA issues. It creates a seamless GUI for the most commonly used machine learning models and may be one of the most exciting things to happen to machine learning and art since the GAN. Because it works natively with Unity, it will be able to work with mobile devices and virtual reality to create mixed reality machine learning art experiences. Unity and Unreal Engine are prime engines for VR development, putting Runway.ml at the forefront of adding machine learning capabilities to virtual reality and augmented reality applications. Art in augmented reality has a wonderful history and future. MoMAR are activists with their own app taking over space in the Museum of Modern Art, democratizing art and creating a message about elitism in the art world. Their app and installation is open source and situated in the Jackson Pollock Room of, where it is unofficially taken up residence as part of the permanent exhibition. While this seems parasitical in nature, leeching off of the reputation and marketing of the gallery, it's um, excuse me, sorry. Uh, they, they leverage their own exhibition uh, with a symbiotic relationship that's driven more visitors to MoMA that might not have otherwise attended. Many people love to unlock secrets and find hidden things to reveal. It's a way to gain new audiences uh, that engage with the art in new and interesting ways. While detractors see a desecration of institutions, defenders see democratization and an exploration of art beyond the confines of what has been established in the annals of art history. From sculpture installations to graffiti to location aware art, we are seeing artists explore the possibilities of adding layers onto our world. There are collaborative augmented reality art projects and ephemeral works, permanent works, and thanks to public art collectives and mavericks like MoMAR, augmented reality can be seen as a form of open source for art and art displays, a revolutionary concept in democratizing art. Suddenly we can hack museums to show our work or alter the work of famous artists and respond to it. We can install work in public spaces without permits and react to each other's art. This puts art back into the hands of the artists rather than in the hands of elite institutions and galleries. It allows us to subvert the mainstream and create our own realities to hack the art world. And with emerging browser-based AR technologies, we can enable it for anyone with a browser in an instant rather than relying on an app download. So why bring machine learning and augmented reality technologies together? 
apart from the fact that they're very cool, what purpose does it serve? We're already seeing the two unite in Snapchat and Instagram filters. But does it have any real world applications beyond the frivolous? Do the two together provide any meaningful ways to engage with the world? Some of the simplest and best use of AR and AI together are in the form of translation algorithms and language education. Using your device's camera to read a sign and translate it for you in real time having those results superimposed over the sign. It's clean, practical, and simple. Google Translate is the most famous of these, but there are a range of live augmented reality translation apps available. Apps such as Memrise also teach language by using image detection. So as you point your phone at your cat in the app, it will tell you it's an echo or a gato or a shot. There are augmented reality travel guides and maps that will hover information about the location in your device and tell you how to get around or allow you to explore a location or a museum just by moving around your home. Imagine how helpful that is for people who cannot travel for affordability reasons or for accessibility. Imagine being able to tour museums anywhere in the world without traveling there or hovering over a city and moving around it. View Ranger is an app that recognizes geological features in Skyline and defines them for hikers to show the best results and the best trails. It's also being used by search and rescue teams to be able to find lost hikers, making it an invaluable resource. Wikitude World Browser is a practically ancient technology from 2008 that leverages Wikipedia to identify things near you and give you information about it. It uses your phone compass, location data, and image recognition to provide con content on worlds of items and locations. If you're like me and you have a bad habit of taking photos and forgetting why you took them, or taking a picture to look up later, Google Lens is particularly useful. It uses image recognition to return information on photos you have in Google Photos. And while it isn't technically augmented reality yet, it is being worked on to give you live feedback in augmented reality. It can be used to save data from business cards to your contacts, add a date to your calendar, read reviews about books and more. Imagine how powerful it will be in augmented reality to have the power of Google behind your camera working in real time. We will see suggestion algorithms and advertising start to become more prevalent. <laughs> Makeup store Charlotte Tilbury installed magic mirrors in their Westfield stores in London that scan a user's face and, augment, and automatically augment their face to add some of their signature looks in real time. Retail AR from Dent Reality has been working on a grocery shopping app that will navigate you to the aisle you need and suggest meal options for different ingredients. It uses machine learning to locate you within the store and to help you find what you need and suggestion algorithms to help you decide what to make for dinner. IKEA already uses AR for furnishing your room. I doubt it will be long before they leverage recommendation technologies to recognize your style and the pieces you already own and suggest options based on those and display them to you in real time. There's already something like that for art called Artific where you can answer questions about your taste and preview art on your walls that suits the color palette of your room. Research into accessibility in combining augmented reality and artificial intelligence is also underway, with a recent experiment using augmented reality headsets to help teach children with autism how to identify emotions by turning it into a game. The children and their parents both reported an increase in their understanding and responsiveness, with one child saying that they're a mind reader. Huawei has created an app for deaf children that uses the phone camera to analyze the words in children's books and read the story to them using sign language. Many deaf children struggle to learn to read, and applications such as this could help bridge that gap. There are wearables enabling subtitles to be augmented onto movies and one in development for live captioning of speech in conversation. It will be wonderful to see the world made more accessible with wearables and augmented reality technologies. 
effort is already underway to restore archaeological artifacts digitally and display information about them in situ for tourists via augmented reality. La Lonia is at the forefront of this research, creating an augmented reality presentation for visitors that allows them to explore the architectural qualities of the heritage protected building and the construction. Low light conditions necessary to preserving historical sites is, uh, is necessary, but augmented reality provides greater accessibility and access to the details of the architecture without compromising it. AR is ideal for archaeological sites, preserving them as they are, harnessing the technology of the future to allow us to learn from the past while maintaining the integrity of the artifacts and the site. But in the future, we will also harness neural networks to restore and translate text and display it locally for you in your language on your phone. Neural networks will access historical data to restore the original colors of statues and frescoes and experience preserved for future generations. And then, because we are the way we are, there will probably be an a photo opportunity to insert yourself inside the fresco being semantically seamlessly style matched. We will have personal tour guides in new cities tailored to our personal interests and past experiences, restaurants that are recommended based on their handling of our own dietary requirements. We will see medical diagnostics with a human doctor supplemented by, by an AR headset and leveraging a diagnostic AI to diagnose faster and more accurately than without augmentations. We'll see engineering diagnostics helping to solve problems in the field with a handy heads up display and remote desktop support enabling people to fix their devices with diagrammatic support supplied live to their phones or wearables showing the exact program problem. I'm personally hanging out for a heads up display that shows me, uh, pe tells me people's names and where I know them from. Honestly, I could also use something that helps me detect emotions and sarcasm better. <laughs> These are all functions of machine learning and all are in active development, even sarcasm detection. But beyond that, I'd love to see augmented reality used with Spotify to recognize your surroundings or activities and tailor your music to match. A machine learning based soundtrack to your life and your daily activities. I'd love to be able to change my world to be more artistic at the push of a button, to semantically style transfer people and backgrounds on the fly. I'd love for my works to work in real time rather than being pre-programmed. I'd love to play an AR or VR game and select the style it's rendered in, to be able to hack my reality and create the visuals and the soundtrack for it as I exist in it, as I move about the world. What purpose does all of this serve? Of course, art doesn't need a purpose. It just is. But the purpose behind the more commercial realizations of this technology are clear. From making the world smaller and more accessible through linguistic assistance and mapping to selling products people actually need tailored for them in their homes. Mixed reality can bring the world to you and machine learning can learn what you need, learn your interests and your tastes and learn to tailor it for you. As more companies are working on AR wearables, we can expect to see these technologies cross over more and more. We can see it permeate. And while the focus will be on advertising and selling, I hope that we will also see ways to make our world more beautiful, more filled with the wisdom of the world. And as the power of our phones increase, the more powerful the machine learning interactions will be. Augmented reality is the bridge between the physical and digital worlds. As those worlds get blurred together by the accessibility and pervasiveness of technology, we will need that bridge more and more. Companies are predicting wearable glasses will be used in technical jobs, medical ones, enabling problem solving and diagnostics in a seamless way. We have ways of making the world smaller whether it's talking to a hologram of a friend in front of you or translating signs and things we need to say on the fly. I hope that it will, it will lead to a world of flowing graffiti, of artwork waiting to be discovered and interacted with or walked through, a chance to alter our worlds and make them more fantastical, more inspiring, 
more beautiful by working together. By connecting that with machine learning, we are allowing machines into our own worlds. Blurring that line even further, we're able to collaborate with machines to teach them and create artwork together. And that can be seen in the real world through the medium of the screen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Um, we've got time for some questions. If anyone has any anything they want to ask, and yep. we do. Um, you sound very excited about the possibilities that you know the world will get smaller, and I, I know that you mean that in the positive kind of forming connections between people and that kind of thing. Do you also have concerns that this sort of thing can end up, the, the way the technology is used as opposed to the technology itself, can end up making the world a smaller place in an unhelpful way? Yes, I do. I worry about what it's going to do in the hands of the governments, um, especially some of the more toxic governments. Um, I definitely worry that, you know, like online bullying and stuff like that, that could become more of a pervasive issue. But I, I guess I chose to focus on the positive uh, outcomes and hope that that's the future we're going to create because I do feel like we're trending towards a positive future, so. Sure, can I have another question if nobody else has one? <laughs> um, so talking about gender and, you know, just the way that technology affects our idea of gender. Um, I'm thinking of, this is a really simple example, something like, Places where machine learning doesn't work the way that we exp or doesn't work the way that it was intended to because of stereotypes getting in the way of training material. Is your work or, or in your work do you explore those like how? I guess how political is your work? Ah, uh, it's very very political. Especially my um uh, my PhD research is um, I'm going to be creating a very biased network and then seeing what I can do to unbias it and watching the artwork that it produces as it as it unbiases. So my my main area of research is actually in how when we train uh, most people when they they train a data set it's very very biased. Um, it's largely white men. And so I want to see what, what happens, you know, when you slowly unbias that and how, what, what kind of worlds we can create, I guess. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen because I've only, I'm not, I haven't quite started my PhD yet, but um, I'm hoping that it will be quite enlightening. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? As AR takes over, how do we counter deterioration of physical skills? Oh. Um, I mean, the, 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 uh, as an example, I've read uh, in medicine in the UK, one of the problems they're having training new doctors is because as we're growing up, we fiddle with things with our hands less, so their manual skills deteriorate. The more we rely on AR, the less we're doing with our hands again. So. Is this an issue people are thinking about? Is this that you know of? Or I would, I, I'm, I I'm haven't just curious. come across it myself. Um, I would suspect that uh, the main deterioration might be in the eyes. If you're constantly used to having everything zoomed in for you, you might have difficulty readjusting. And so that could be an issue later on. Um, but I think that you know, it, like if we're gamifying more, and I think that there should be, I love games, so I think there should be more games in the world. Um, that actually increases dexterity. There's been a lot of studies to show that gaming increases your hand-eye coordination. It increases your manual dexterity and things like that. Um, there's also, uh, a lot of people are encouraging fidgeting, um, or at least not like demonizing fidgeting as much for kids uh, like when I was growing up. So we're allowed to have our little toys and kids are um, growing up being able to do things like that. And I think that that's going to help with that sort of thing as well, rather than this sit on your hands, stop fidgeting. 
focus. So I, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> well, it's not much of a question, but have you seen the video called Hyper Reality on Vimeo? Hyper Reality. With the lady on the bus and getting a job and going shopping and stuff. No, I don't think so. You should enjoy I'll look it up. Hyper Reality. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Do you think that one day we'll end up in a world where you don't know whether or not when you reach out you're actually touching something or just a projection? I kind of hope so. That sounds like a complete <laughs> blast, really. It's a, it sounds like a bit of a... Um, I'm trying to think of a word without swearing. <laughs> but yes, it sounds, it, it sounds like a trip. But um, I think it'd be fun. You know, sort of not knowing what's real and what's not uh, could be uh, possibly very difficult for people with dissociative issues, but um, very interesting. It depends on our resolution. And I think, you know, if it's involving wearables and stuff like that rather than contacts, you can always just take them off and go, oh, oh, wow, you're all blurs. Um, but, you know, you can take them off and see that, you know, the world really is what it is. Mm. All right, any other questions? When I was young, they said, oh, VR is going to make it so that you play a video game where you murder your teacher, <laughs> and then you're going to play it so much, and you're going to come to class and not remember if you're in real life or not. What do you think, like what you just said before? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I remember those, those sorts of things. Uh, you know, um, uh, Lawnmower Man was sort of, yeah, and, and that sort of era of, oh my goodness, VR, that's, that's going to be the next. And they're still trying to make it the next big thing, and the technology's improving. But I, I don't know, I own a headset, and I've never had difficulty distinguishing real from um, fake there. Um, you know, it, apart from the fact that it becomes quite a lot of pressure on your head after a while, it, um, you, it, the, the resolution isn't there and things like that. So I, I don't know, it hasn't changed the way I think, but I have met a lot of technologists who are really afraid that they're going to be, that their minds are going to be altered. Still, like I was talking to some, I think last year about VR, um, and how they're terrified to try it because they're afraid it's going to it's going to change the way they think. It's going to um, make them somehow violent or make them somehow uh, uh, difficult. I, I play soft games in VR. I don't like uh, jump scares and things like that. Um, so maybe I'm not necessarily the right target market. <laughs> but I um, I think that you know it, if it's in you to do, then maybe, but if it's not, then it's not going to turn you into something you're not. Yes. Sorry, just going back to an earlier question about bias and AI, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the data sets, um, unfortunately, are already biased mm. purely based on the fact that we live in our society today. What are some of the ways that you have or you're thinking of to combat some of those biases? I'm thinking sort of, you know, earlier when Amazon trialed, you know, AI for screening CVs and they found out that they got a very biased result and they sort of scrapped the program and things like that. Mm. I remember that. That was, uh, I mean, there are so many awful articles coming out about um, the bias in AI, and that's part of why I want to do the work I want to do. The way I'm going to be doing it is I'm going to be creating my own data set from scratch um, using 3D rendering. Um, so all of my models are going to be um, uh, created using uh, uh, animated camera and stuff like that so that I can capture hun uh, hundreds with one uh, render but uh, with one pose and everything. And then, so I'm going to start with uh, largely white men, and then I'm going to actually shift, shift the data set and see how it goes. Um, but I think that it's, 
it's so important to be able to explore that. I, I want to, the reason I'm going with my own data set rather than, you know, leeching off of uh, something else like um, uh, d grabbing images from Google or Flickr or um, uh, Instagram. I've got an Instagram scraper. Um, I think that it's important to go, right, this is the cleanest data set I can make. And that's the, the best way to, I guess, scientifically approach it. It means I can control all the variables, which is, it can be a problem as well. So I might um, also do a scraped photographic data set separately, but yeah. yeah. All right, well, we're actually out of time now. So